This meeting is being recorded. Okay, hey girls, good evening. How are you today? Good. Here we are. Okay, let me share my screen. Ooh, we were, oh God, I don't see it here. Wait a second. Okay, wait a second. Oh no, this is not it. There you go. I think it's this one. Oh, wait. Here it is. Can you see it now? I just see your email right now. Oh gosh. Oh, the sharing's, wait, 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 wait. It's the uh, recent sharing. But I don't see it now. Wait, can you see it? I see that you're loading a new tab. Yes. Yeah. Because I can. Okay. Sorry. You're good. I have to do it here. It will take. Come on. Just when you're ready. <laughs> it's taking forever. Here it is. Come on, we're wasting time. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Okay, let me go here with this. Wait. Oh. oh god wait a second there you go okay yes i got it now okay sorry about that it took forever okay welcome to my plc number seven presentation Co cognitive aspect of sla my three topics are mediation private speech and zone of proximal development okay Mediation. Me mediations. It goes like resection. I have here, like I've explained it right here. Resection, resection, mediation, interaction, and then production. That means the output. Okay, kind of about like output. Did I get quicker again? This is Wally asking, is she there? She's not here with us. She's not. Oh, I see her in the chat. Uh, so, or the participants. Can you tell her that we cannot, you are, yeah, no, I don't see her. It says three, but I don't see her. Mm -hmm. Tell her that we don't see her. Okay, uh, let's go real quick with mediation. Okay, I was here first, okay. When you're using language, okay, it says that um, socially, because we are, there are things that we do not know when you're like when you're learning from a textbook, like I said before, um, what we're talking before, um, you're learning from a book, okay, and then you have like until you you do not talk to somebody else or you um, do like interact with somebody, you don't know how to put the the thing that you already know, like the grammar thing that you got from that book. You will never find out if you don't interact with somebody. It's when you get the idea and, and would you really, Wally, you're two times there. <laughs> so you're not, if you're not interact with someone, you are not going to understand how to use it or when to use it, okay? Once you get the, um, okay, you're twice there, mi amor. Hey, baby. Hey. I want to have the two, two, the two, the two pieces here. here. Okay, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Keep on going. I got lost. Going. Wait, wait a second. I got lost here. Okay, med uh, it says that mediation is just how you figure it out and how to use it in a social, cultural, cultural and activity. Like when you are going out and talk to somebody or you go out, um, like, um, when you need to say something, okay, and you have to figure it out how to say it, okay, 
And then after you mediate that language several times, then you're going to get it like right here um, over and over um, on your brain. Like you're ready now. I don't know if you got the point, girl. I got lost with this, all the things. <laughs> and like, I, ha I have like a good example when we are like in a basketball game and you know everything about basketball game and I'm only no somewhere. So we're gonna get it like together and I'm gonna figure it out. Talk about that baseball game only with a few words that I know. So we're like interaction about that um, basketball game. Okay, private speech is kind of like um, talking to yourself, like things that uh, make sense. Like we can say it like out loud, but it's for yourself. Uh, a good example for me is when I go to an IEP meeting and there is some words that I don't know and that I'm thinking this in my um, native language, how to say it in um, LA too. In this case, uh, when we talk about like learning disability, I have to find the word for learning disability. It's, it's not the same um, in Spanish. You know, and I'm trying to get that, that um, like on my trying to do it like in my second language, but at the same times like my native language. You know, and or when well, yeah, I got that one. It's the same. I was gonna say it another example, but it's kind of um the same. And this is the son of Proxima Development by by Golsky. We already talked about this and uh we all three knows about um how it goes. And it's um, I got a mistake right there. I had to fix it. What I can do, okay, by myself that I already know. And the son of Proxima Development is like when the student get like around, can do it with help or without like a peer help or, or something. And then the blue one shows you like the learner cannot do it, not even with, um, it's just kind of like too hard, not even with help. I have um, a real quick, um, like it's a short one. It's like a cartoon from um, K Skidmore that is talk, it's talk about the son of uh, proximal development. I just want to go real quick with this one. Like the example, he was trying to get to the red flag, but it's not the way, the easier way to go. It's way too hard for him. So this is where we go and try to help him go this way. So taking him to the ZPD zone with assistant knowledge. So go on, go on to the next one. Try. Isn't that nice? I love it. <laughs> okay. This is it. Goodbye. But I'm staying. <laughs> Let me see how can I take this out of you. <laughs> that was pretty good, Swimmer. <sighs> Thank you. I'll try. I do my Abby, best. That will what she chose also is that kind of scaffolding. That will yes. be kind of scaffolding, yes. right? That yes. you're going, you're going because you know, I mean, teachers use oh, we are scaffolding, scaffolding, and scaffolding for me is a new concept that I just got to know right now uh, lately. So mm -hmm. I'm still learning. So that's what it's. Yes, me too. Every time they say scaffolding, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I think I got it. 
the zone of proximal development is like the basis for scaffolding. If you know where the ZPV is, then you know where to start your scaffolding. At, okay, basically. great. Thank you, Abby. Okay. Thank Here you. I That's go. good. I, okay. I got 10 minutes. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Let's hope this works. And if not, like I say, I have the second computer ready. And you see my computer now? Yes. Okay. So hopefully it's falling. Okay. Yes. This is PLC number seven, correct? Yes. I remember now. Okay. So while we uh, we were working about the social aspect of second language acquisition, it was based in the book of understandings. Uh, second language acquisition by Ellis R and chapter nine. My three topics, if this thing wants to work, it would be better. My three topics, again, just like Suma, was med mediation, the sociocognitive approach, and language socialization and L2 learning. Mediation. Mediation was presented by Landform and Thorne in 2006, and it says, that is the pro uh, is external regulation when an external regulation occurs and technically is the use of a tool to help us to perform a task the tools call, could be culturally constructed artifacts like we have here the dictionaries okay the bilingual dictionaries or it could be social interaction which is what are we going to concentrate more it serves as the primary means for mediation learning okay um, but also allow learners to mediate with each other during the learning. That's part of it. Hold on, I lost myself right here. Um, social interaction was also researched by two different people. <laughs> One of them it was Ota in 2001. He talked to us about the mediation devices. Let me zoom in a little bit. Um, in the mediation devices, we have waiting when we allow the learner extra time. When we are prompting, uh, we are helping the learner to continue. We, we when we co construct with the learner, so we are either helping him out or completing the uh, the, the sentence, and also like Suma and I usually do explanation when at the end we just go back and we provide it in the L1 of the student. That's one of the uh, approaches. And like I say, it was done in, by Onta in 2001. Um, then we have also Mr. Landfall that Suma kind of talk, talk to about him already. Landfall talked to us about social and private speech. So social and um, private, uh, social is serves to establish an, an, an interpersonal mediation through private. And the private is like Suma was talk, uh, saying is that speech that you do to yourself it, and it's not limited to the internal speech, but also the how you say the audible one and usually it has some errors but it's like you are doing a pep talk to yourself you're trying to prepare yourself to continue um long four also in, uh, introduces us to the what is called the concept of med mediation is where the meaning of the cultures construct to make sense of the world so is, is this concept of mediation can be every day which is the spontaneous one that we all have, or the scientific, which is highly explicit, is available for conscious manipulation and analysis, and requires a concept-based instruction. Learners are given very specific scientific description. That will be more like what I have with my students in a, a biology class, where they are giving them the content, but the teacher is trying to break it down to them as basic as possible, in language, but still is not your everyday. So what do I conclude of all these? All learnings are, are my, all learning 
is mediated, <laughs> mediated because we have to meet somewhere, we have to provide some tools, we have to help them somehow. And there comes my, my example, my classroom example. We're always mediating as we work with students, no matter if they are EL's or not. But a perfect example for us in, for, in an ESL class is when a newcomer student approach you and you know they wanna go to the bathroom because you see the body language, you know that's where they wanna do. And you and he say me, me, and you you try to help them out to put together the sentence to ask you to go to the bathroom. My second topic was the soci hold on. Oh, I went the wrong way. The socio-cognitive -cogn approach. Uh, the socio-cognitive approach was presented by two main researchers, Badstone and Atkins. And they emphasize the learning as a participation when mind and body come together in and through the interaction that occurs with other specific situations and con contests. Baston talked to us in 2011 saying that learning as participation is when the mind and body come together. Okay. Oh, I just realized I put it twice. <laughs> Banston say that is the two dimensions that come together and there is always a prior conception from previous interaction that, okay, I know bathroom is baño, so I'm going to say I am, is, is when you connect the dots, uh, is the conver convergency of the two worlds and learning takes place when there is a challenge that causes modification to our knowledge. It goes hand to hand, I will say, with the stone of proximity development, because it's like you are you are getting challenged. Therefore, your socialization requires you to open more your vocabulary or your knowledge about something. Um, I'm sorry. Then we have Mr. Atkins. Mr. A I'm sorry, Mr. Atkinson. Mr. Atkinson also was in 2011, and he doesn't see like two separate words. He sees them as they coexist and interact simultaneously. And uh, to be honest with you, I agree with him. Uh, he say they are, uh, they are not mental, but they are at the same time happening. He rejects internalization. He said that learning is completely external. That part is where I'm like, mm, not so much. I don't agree, but yeah, you, you got points. Uh, but he said that everything is going to become to alignment. Through the interaction, the learners, uh, they align to the environment. That alignment is necessary. It's like, okay, I want to get this done. In order to get this done, I have to say this. And I have, and uh, Abby is talking about this, so I need to say this to connect to. But, he refused that that's internal to me, that's internal, that's not external, but hey, he's a researcher, Who? what do I know? Knowledge of an L2 is not a strike, but it's a situa situation depend process. So your knowledge is gonna be changing as the situation is presented to you, like for Sulmana is right now, or knowledge is growing and advancing as we're talking about different stuff and um, learning about it. An example for me is the same student had to connect the knowledge that he already had from what you teach him before, how to say bathroom, how to say go. And so the next time he comes to you, he say me bathroom, please. And that's when you're gonna come and say, hey, baby, it's not like this. We just put the sentence now together. He already have the knowledge of the words from before. Now we're gonna, teach them the syntax and the correct formation of the sentence. Then we get to my favorite one, and it's language socialization and L2 learning. The Ellie say that the is the practice by which novice and common in a community are socialized both into the form of language and into the values, behaviors, and practice of the community in which they live. If you're learning the language, you're gonna learn about the community. They, they're going to me, they're gonna go hand to hand. And that's part of what Le Leif and Wenners in 1991 say, there is what is called the community of practice. Learning in L2 entails becoming a member of the community and the, uh, of a practice. 
So if we are here in the United States, we're going to learn about the, the, the behaviors, the customs, and the social life. So social practice and learning have to go together in order for, it, uh, for one or the other to happen. Uh, it's a mutual engagement, it's a joint enterprise, and it's a chair repertory. What I learn about my friends saying, I'm gonna repeat it as I learn it, because that's the way I'm gonna interact with them. Um, language Socialist, uh, well learned and cold say that is, and I agree with them, it's not a necessary, a very smooth process. It's gonna have bumps, it's gonna go up and down. Community of practice is not fixed and stable. No, because it's gonna keep on changing as new members come. And Abby, you can say, and uh, Sulma and I, as we get new, new students, we have to adapt to what we're saying and how we're saying it for the new. And definitely the new, the members in the community, and you see it with your new students and the others, they are gonna help the newest one to become members of this, helping them through interaction. And this interaction can be either explicit because they're saying, hey, you say this, ban you, or, Follow me, look at me, and you and they learn it like that. Okay. Um, and last but not least, did you um, they come a whole bunch of critics about it, saying that the researchers always pay more attention to the interaction than to the result of this. And then uh, there are some that say socialization is both social and cognitive. You have a lot of other studies, but at the end. None of them really prove that out of socialization, there is acquisition, unfortunately. So even so, we all agree that socialization is part of it. There is no research that's proven that. And that's it for me. Let me stop the sharing. Abby, your turn. Okay. I'm going to try to go okay. really quick and leave us at least five minutes to talk at the end. Um, uh -huh. I'm sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Here we go. Um, I'm going to get rid of that. There we go. Okay. Let me present. Do, 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 do. Okay. So we're talking about the social aspects of second language acquisition. And as um, a, a younger a member of the team, I had to go with the social media route because that is what I see uh, influencing a lot of my kids um, recently. So um, oh, gotta click the little button. Okay, so today's topics are mediation, the social identity approach and investment in identity. Okay, so getting right to it. Mediation, um, this one is probably one of my favorites because I feel like not only do we mediate in everyday activities at school in all of our learning, but I think that we also um, have a lot of different mediation as well. Um, in our language learning. And I put the quote right here that Lantoff and Thorne said in 2006, because I just don't think it can be said any better. It's the process through which humans deploy culturally constructive artifacts, concepts, and activities to regulate, i.e. gain voluntary control over and transform the material world. So I didn't ever think about the fact of a dictionary or maybe a textbook or a translation app being something that we use as mediation, but the book really brought that to my mind as something that I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm mediating with the book. Um, but I liked how it really focused on the social interaction portion of this um, because it transforms other regulation into self-regulation. And I loved how the book said that because we, even though we can use all these different things, once we have depended on the other artifact or other person in that interaction to help us mediate um, it then becomes self-regulation just like Wally said in her example of instead of the student not knowing how to say to go to the bathroom they might say baño por favor or something like that or bathroom please they might know and so that's really cool to me and so there's four different types and Wally covered those as well so waiting prompting co-construction explana explanation and since she already got those I'm not going to talk about those but those are the four different types of mediation and I said, why is this important? And I think that this is awesome because learners don't just learn from artifacts like textbooks. That's so important is that we cannot learn everything from a textbook, which is why me and Crash and Buttheads lot on <laughs> what we believe. Um, and so conversely, I think learners learn from more from interaction and um, that experience of having interaction with not only other learners, but also native speakers. 
Okay, and so my classroom example is students who are learning a second language work together to have a conversation about in the L2 about a book that they read. Um, and so the learners help correct each other's punctuation, spelling, and grammar during this interaction. So I've got a little puzzle right here that we're all putting the puzzle pieces together. Okay, the social identity approach. I love this one. I'm all about socialization. I love all of the social approaches. I love all this new stuff. So Miller and Kubota came up with something super, super cool. And in 2013, they decided that identity isn't um, just something that is stagnant. It's something that changes over time and it should be taken into consideration as a constantly fluctuating view of how we see ourselves. So this can be typical aspects of identity such as gender and race, but it can also be non-typical aspects such as native speaker and non-native speaker, which I think is so cool because we all think we start off in our L2 as a non-native speaker, but as we progress, we start to build up more confidence in ourselves and that identity might change. It never might, it's never might be native speaker, but you might be like, like, oh, I'm not a native speaker, but like, I feel like I can say I'm a part of this culture now, which is really cool. And like being able to see that identity develop in my students is just absolutely amazing. Um, and so we have different um, multiple, multiple social identities and different like principles of this one um, approach that we have. So the, they are that we have multiple social identities. Social identity is all subjective, meaning that it doesn't really we can't say anything is concrete about social identity, that it's always changing, always moving. Um, and it's also subjective to that one person. It's that one person's point of view. Um, it's how they see themselves. Conflicts can come due to multiple identities forming, which is um, why do, well, I'm doing my paper on heritage language learners, because a lot of conflicts can arise from being a heritage language learner when you have those multiple identities at school and then at home, two different cultures. Um, power and the perception of power is extremely important um, and so being able to understand what power comes with learning a certain language or what perception they might have which I'm going to talk about in a minute and in investment um, of how invested they are and that has to do with their perception of how much power or what they can gain by learning this language um, the learner's dual investment is key so not only their investment um, in wanting power, but also their investment in themselves, in their identity. They have to be invested in the person that they want to be. And then social identity is dynamic. And I said, why is this important? It's because learners are never blank slates waiting for a canvas. They are already changing works of art. Language is not just a skill, but an identity as well. Um, and I fully wholeheartedly believe that. Okay, and so my classroom approach is new students in my classroom have a specific way that they perceive themselves as the Spanish kids. Um, so even my other Spanish students that are heritage speakers call them the Spanish kids as well, um, even though they speak Spanish. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> but it's all about their identity and how they perceive their so themselves. And this is because these learners are new to the English language. So that's just one example I see of identity in my classroom and how that's played out and how I'm starting to see that change as they start to learn more English, which is really cool. Okay, and then my last one is investment in identity. And anytime there we talk about investment, I'm hooked. I want to talk about it. Um, I think it's really important, especially as um, a United States um, citizen who learned a foreign language, which is, I mean, common, but not super common um, here in the South. And so being invested in that learning process is key for me. And so um, I love learning about it. I love learning about how that affects how we learn. So um they said that language learners have a choice about their form of interaction with the target language. So there's two different kinds of motivation. We've kind of talked about this already in the class. There's instrumental and integrative. Instrumental is what can I'm, what am I going to use this language for? How do I function in society in this language? Um, basically only using it for work or times that they have to. And integrative is wanting to be a part of that target language culture. Um, so investment in language learning has to do with the relationship between power, identity, and second language acquisition, which is super important. Like I said in the previous section, power is very important, um, how we perceive the power that we can have with the two to either being bilingual, which is super powerful, I think it's a superpower, um, but also your identity and how you perceive yourself and how you perceive how difficult it might be to learn that language and second language acquisition. Um, one of the terms they coined in the other article that we had to read was cultural capital which I think is really cool. Um, and that's just thinking about 
um, the things that we can gain, the materials or the symbolic materials that we can gain by investing in our language. And everything about investment is based on individual perception. And the example that they used in the article was the native speakers of English and the English language learners in a classroom in Canada. And they basically said that the native speakers said that the English language learners weren't invested because they weren't saying anything in the classroom and the English language learners didn't want to speak up because they were trying to take everything in. So just saying it's all about investment um, as a perception. How are you invested? Um, other people cannot in determine how much you're invested in your classroom. And then the notion of investment, which is basically the same thing, um, just kind of talking about the individual perceptions. And then my classroom example is actually a real life example. So I have student A um, views learning English as a new skill, enjoys making or enjoys school and making friends and recognizes the advantage of being bilingual, excited about U.S. culture. The other student views school as annoying and a waste of time, is not accepting of the fact that they're in the U.S., hides the ability to speak English because they do not want to participate in English classrooms, even though I know student B can speak English because <laughs> I see them do it at lunch. And both our L2 English learners recently moved to the United States within the past two years. Um, so super, super cool to be able to see how investment in the language affects these two students. Um, but that's all that I have. Thank you for listening. Okay, we got five minutes. Okay, five minutes. So the five topics it. that we all agree was the mediation, social identity, language socialization, zone of proximal development, and investment on your identity. Mm -hmm. me mediation, <laughs> because everything is mediated. Language, lane learning cannot, be, cannot happen without either the social interaction, without the tools, without the book, without anything that we use to soak up the knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, ladies, anything else you want to add? Well, I believe that um, like mediation and ZPD, it kind of like related to because they're like social like interaction and we're pushing that kid to go forward. And I think it's kind of the, you know, kind of the same. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree that mediation is used in all learning, not whether or not you're an English language learner or a second language learner or not. I think it's important we're all mediating with the different symbolic elements all around us, being able to interact or use our textbooks and all the certain things. Um, but I'll go on to the second one and I'll mm -hmm. talk about social identity. Um, and I think that's super important with everything that we've talked about because how we perceive ourselves and how our identity changes as we are learning language is really important to consider as factors that affect our learning and how we see ourselves and our goals for what our um, acquisition should be in our target language um, that's all going to be affected by how we perceive ourselves in our in our identity which I think is super important and super fun to know about each of your students because it's so unique to each individual so just being able to ask them about that is really cool and that's part of the language socialization which is our third uh, topic because even so researchers have no proof or have got concrete proof of that socialization affecting the acquisition we all agree that you are not going to be able to learn about your student if you don't socialize it and if you don't find that bridge to know them and he's not going to learn about you your culture and everything without that knowledge you being the most, most expert one in the classroom you are the one who's going to teach them and help them to become members of the community and as they become members of the community obviously they're going to acquire have acquisition of the language and move on therefore you as a teacher learning uh, uh, about their socialization, you're going to determine the zone of proximal development. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, it's my turn, right? I'm sorry. Okay. I just want to go at the end. Okay. Just do it. Go ahead, Bobby. Go with the fifth one and I will close with um. Okay. ZPD. Cool. Um, so also we wanted to talk about our investment in identity, which also has to do with language socialization, because depending on how invested we are in our learners and in their identity, we'll be able to determine their investment in their identity and how much they're invested in learning this second language, which will also lead us to their zone of proximal development or the zone of proximal development they want us to see. They, they might not want us to see how high of a level that they're at. Sometimes they do that. Um, so they decide mm -hmm. to be selecting mutis. Yes. Oh yes. 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 Yeah, and we'll find out what's going on, and that's what it is. Yep. Yeah. I got two. Like no way. 
I'm gonna yes. skip here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You go ahead, Zuma. Okay, this is uh my favorite one. <laughs> wait go a Zuma, second, I cannot find it. it. Wait, 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 wait. Zuma, you got a minute. <laughs> oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, I get a minute. Okay. You got a minute. Okay, I got um this one. We already talked about uh Vygotsky, um um ZPD, which is like uh, a space between what kid can do and what he cannot do. Like it's really hard. And in the middle, like the ZPD, where is where we add. And I have a 60 second. Um I don't think we have time. It's less than one minute, but I love it. 60 seconds. <laughs> like we all talk about this look it's, it's, it is. it's social it is a social and I the mean, teacher and a guide like the, like the teacher as at like a guide for everything mm -hmm. there we are Okay, ladies, it was a pleasure okay. to see you all. I Have know.